I would like to first address my opponent's concerns that the Libertarians will not truly be able to adopt a balanced budget. While she is correct that both parties have tried and failed in the past, none of these parties have ever supported a constitutional amendment to require one. This is a level of commitment to a balanced budget that has never been seen before, and it is what the Libertarians call for. Thus, the government would be required by the highest law in the land to ensure that the budget stay balanced. It was balanced under President Clinton, so we know that this is not some impossible feat. My opponent also expressed concern that budgets are constructed on projections, and that we may get three-fourths of the way through the year and find that our projections were off. Even if this were the case, the government would be required by law to proceed with the same amount of money they already set aside, and would not be allowed to balance the budget by raising taxes. So, they would have to reevaluate their spending and decide how to best allocate the remaining funds. This level of fiscal responsibility has rarely been seen in past governments and would be extremely beneficial to the U.S. economy. In addition, my opponent claims that a supermajority would be needed in the taxing system the Libertarians propose. I believe she is referring to a clause in the flat tax proposition, which does require a two-thirds supermajority to raise taxes. However, the Libertarian Party is not calling for flat tax, but rather for fair tax, which has no supermajority requirements written into it. Furthermore, while this fair tax system will eliminate income and payroll tax, it will not eliminate taxes altogether. There will be a 23% sales tax on all goods and services, and this money goes directly to the government so that they can accomplish things like building roads, which my opponent expressed concern about. In terms of the military, the Libertarian Party does not call for no military, merely less involvement in foreign affairs. In fact, they insist upon maintaining a sufficient military to defend the United States against attack. They would, however, like to stop wars like the one currently going on in Afghanistan. And yes, our invasion of the Middle East was necessary after the cowardly attacks of 9-11, for we needed to take action against the Taliban and their supporters. However, ten years down the line, dictator Saddam Hussein and 9-11 orchestrator Osama bin Laden are both dead, and our need to continue fighting died with them. At this point, what we have lingered so long to do is to impose democracy in these nations. However, I argue that neither Iraq nor Afghanistan currently have the structural stability or the will to become true democracies. We simply cannot democratize the world, no matter how many soldiers we sacrifice. Look at our most recent wars before Iraq and Afghanistan. We sent 58,000 servicemen to die in Vietnam fighting against communism, and Vietnam is still communist. And we lost 37,000 soldiers in Korea fighting for freedom, yet North Korea is still not free. No, these soldiers did not die in vain, but every military death is a huge loss to our nation, and we must try at all costs to prevent further loss. Thus, the Libertarians suggest that we start putting American problems first. While its policy is isolationist, if we can learn anything from history, it is that interference in foreign affairs is most often fruitless and detrimental. Rather than spending billions fighting unnecessary wars, we could turn those tax dollars inwards and use them for economy-boosting measures and job creation. The projected military spending for 2012 alone is $1.5 trillion. Think how much good could be done if some of this money were allocated elsewhere. Lastly, my opponent says one of the main reasons America is prosperous is that we are generous to other nations. I could not disagree more. America is prosperous because of our free market and the capitalistic drive of our people. Our mindset of constantly giving to others, while noble, has only ever detracted from our economic prosperity. For these reasons, I conclude that my opponent's concerns against the Libertarian Party are unfounded, and that this party is still the best for the future of America.